to sustain both our political liberty and the enormous economic success that has resulted from that liberty. So is it fair to say that as we become clients of totalitarianism, that this is really an intended outcome? I believe it is, yes. I think that's what we're up against right now. And it's one of the reasons why we have this political system that is producing alternatives that offer no real alternative to the underlying reliance on a little clique of uh, bureaucratic and political and corporate power makers who are then basically going to usurp the role that should properly be played by the people themselves in determining the future of the country. We are losing government of, by, and for the people, what the founders called the republic. Uh, it is being destroyed, and it is being replaced uh, by an oligarchic empire of government that will take a form, by the way, that's quite interesting to me, because it's an alliance of the bureaucracy, the politicians, and the corporate moguls in their own selfish interest. Does that not sound like an older version that we called fascism? I do believe you. That's why it was called, and it's sometimes something people forget because we use the term Nazi, right? Nazi was the, the, the term, the uh, uh, short term, came from words that were part of the title of that party, Nacional Socialismo. It was a form of socialism. And it was a form of socialism that was predicated on this kind of an alliance between the government bureaucracy, the corporate moguls, the ambitious politicians, and ultimately implemented, by the way, without regard, uh, of course, for a real individual, personal, or family prerogatives and liberties. And sadly, if you look at what's going on these days in, in various elements of our present social as well as political environment, one of the key things is the erosion of our sense. Uh, of individual and family prerogatives in favor of putting power in the hands uh, of government, sometimes represented, of course, by lawless courts uh, that are then imposing upon people without respect for their rights. Once again, you're listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. We can be found at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. And just a reminder, we have several conferences coming up. The first one in Los Angeles, California, on Tuesday, September the 23rd at 6.30 p.m. at the Hyatt Regency Center Plaza. The other is in Homer, Alaska, on Saturday, September the 27th at 9 o'clock a.m. If you'd like to come to either of these conferences, they're free, but we'd like you to call and reserve a place so that we know how many people are coming. Call us at 800-525-9556. Dr. Keyes, this being mainly a financial program, we've oftentimes over the last few months pointed out that these secret meetings that are occurring on Sundays to try to get the announcement out before the Asian markets open are going well beyond the powers that the people gave originally. I mean, the Federal Reserve, which isn't even a government entity, but it acts like one. Mm -hmm. Now, Paulson with the Treasury. You were talking about the, the power being taken from the people. These entities not only are taking power that, that has never been granted them, but they're talking the people into actually begging for the next power grab. That's exactly right, and that's exactly what is happening as a consequence of the perception of the failure of these big financial institutions and, and household words that is occurring even as we speak. It's also, by the way, reflected in what has been happening in terms of things that have a political implication as well as an economic one. Issues that are like immigration, the North American Union, other things of this kind that are the area where politics, international affairs, and economics all meet up. But they are meeting up in such a way as to create structures of decision-making and implementation that have no basis whatsoever in the consent of the people of this country. I don't remember ever being asked to vote for anything about the North American Union. Do you? I don't either. I don't think anybody has. I don't think I received the invitation this past weekend either to the rare emergency trading session open Sunday afternoon that allowed Wall Street dealers to trade in the $455 trillion derivatives market. Mm -hmm. Somebody didn't call me to let me know that I could offset my risk before the market opened. Again, it, it, it is what you described earlier, that the perfect combination of government bureaucracy and corporate moguls getting to pat each other on the back at how brilliant they are and what wonderful opportunities they can open up for themselves at the expense of the people. And the thing that I think is ever more ominous about our situation is that we are now dealing with corporate entities that have no particular allegiance to the political structures that are supposed to at least 
make sure that people have a role in all of this. So that you look at what is going on and you have a bunch of actors who no longer have any allegiance to the constitutional system, to representative government, or any of those things. It is simply now regarded, I think, as a set of structures to be manipulated so that you can use them to create perceptions that will mean there will be less resistance to what you're doing to pursue your own profit. Y'all are open to the interconnectedness of some of these issues, because a lot of people try to treat economics as if it sits off somewhere by itself. It makes it impossible to really deal with things in a serious way. So I really appreciate that. Well, it, it is a conversation worth having, and you, you find that when you look at a worldview, every area of life is interconnected whether it is economics, politics, whether it is law, all of these things are based on fundamental assumptions, assumptions that cross over in, into virtually every, every field or endeavor. That's right. And sometimes I think people will see false choices where there are none because they're not examining the common assumptions that animate both sides, right? Hmm. Uh, and then they'll be closed off to other alternatives that exist because they're not aware that, that the assumptions of their true desires are represented by their uh, other people. So I think that getting to the fundamentals can often open people's eyes. Let's talk about Aristotle for just two seconds. What's your primary source on Aristotle and, and specifically the whole, whole concept of ekos nomos? Well, I think too, he wrote uh, specifically a book on economics that had that as its title. And then uh, you put that together with uh, the politics and the ethics. And I think you get a reasonably full picture of what I'm talking about. Because what's understood at that time and was also understood, by the way, in, in various elements by people who uh, then recast that ancient thinking in a Christian context, was the interconnectedness we're talking about, which mm -hmm. most clearly appears in the household, because the household is not just a material structure. It is rooted in what was called the natural law, right? It mm -hmm. has a dimension that is entirely moral that has to do with the mutual and reciprocal obligations and responsibilities that uh, family members have toward one another based upon a connection that goes beyond material calculation, the kinds of things we talk about in terms of love and devotion. So it has a moral dimension to it. And then, of course, it was, throughout human history, the basic structure for, for producing things, whether it's farm work or, or the work of artisans and things like that. Talent and ability were both developed, implemented, and passed on through the generations, through that kind of corporate entity, which uh, is corporate in the literal sense of the term, meaning to say it represented the body of a people as that body was shared through the genetic code. I really like when you're discussing self-sufficiency, how you tie together the notion of tangible things with real talents being developed towards a certain end. That's right. But see, I think that's something that sadly has been uh, really neglected. It's one of the reasons why socialism is so false. Because even when you go back and you, you sit down and, and think about Marx and, and what he was saying, the fact that these people were materialists, right, ultimately, meant that they completely neglected the dimension of economics that has to do with the deployment of creativity, of talent and ability that, uh, in the first instance, is not tangible because it exists in the will and imagination of individuals, which are then implemented through what they do to form and restructure the material state of the world around them. A good example of that, I remember years ago going to a conference it was between uh, a panel of, of folks who were uh, from the Western countries, or basically the United States, and uh, a panel of people from the developing countries. And one developing country speaker had been talking about the terrible exploitation of Western countries who had robbed the people in the Middle East of, of the assets of oil and all of this. And I got up after he fi uh, finished speaking and pointed out that until the Westerners came, right, with the science and technology that they had developed, oil in the Middle East was simply an obstacle that interfered with what was regarded as the truly precious resource, which was water, right? Mm -hmm. And so to look at the oil and say it was an asset is actually a lie. 